Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so what uh, we'd like to share about Outside In is that it's a series for anyone who's enthusiastic about learning. And uh, these are ecology talks. So they are obviously on topics which are, you know, uh, about the um, about nature and the environment and things like insects or, for instance, this time, branchiopods. Uh, and many other species and how they interact with us and what we have left to learn. And this was an idea that was um, sort of uh, launched by Professor Salamani. And we are very happy to support this uh, program. And uh, uh, is there anything that uh, Sudamani or Mahin would like to add? No, I'm happy that uh, people have come on a Sunday morning. And I also would like to thank Samir uh, for uh, taking that trouble of participating and giving his views. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Pavitra. Great. So uh, Chandrakant will just introduce Samir to everyone who is not aware of uh, his work. Yeah. So um, I think this is our first uh, non-blisk uh, speaker. Uh, for this series uh, now, and uh, I'm really happy uh, that it uh, that it is Samir. So Samir uh, has uh, formerly been a scientist with uh, uh, the Zoo Outreach Organization, the, and uh, he's also been a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the um, at uh, the Laboratory of Biodiversity and Evolutionary Genetics at the University of Leuven, Belgium. And he's also been a visiting fellow at the Yale Peabody Museum of Nat Natural History and also the Evolutionary Biology Laboratory at uh, Basel, Switzerland. Uh, but what I'd like to really talk about uh, what Samir has done is he's been a pioneer uh, in the fields of freshwater biodiversity in the Western Ghats of India. And he has discovered, along with uh, several of his colleagues, uh, he has discovered several new species of uh, uh, freshwater uh, arthropod. And uh, he's really uh, uh, made it his life's effort to bring to the fore the enormous biodiversity that is there in the Western Ghats, which is not um, uh, avian-based or mammalian-based, which uh, do get a lot of attention usually in, uh, in research. So uh, this is a whole new way to look at biodiversity and i assure you when you when he actually begins his talk you will be blown away by uh, you know what you can find in the very uh, highly ignored pools and puddles of the western ghats of india so uh, with that i don't want to speak a lot more uh, he uh, uh, he has been my senior so i do know a lot about his work but i think it's best if he starts with his talk and uh, shows us uh, the beauty of the organisms uh, and the and the group of uh, organisms that he works with. So over to you, Samir. Thank you, thank you, Chandrakant, for that kind introduction. So we'll start the talk. <clears throat> so as Chandrakant mentioned, that uh, is the screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So I'll be talking to you about a group of crustaceans that I have been working for over. 10 years now. And what I want to emphasize through this talk is that, as Chandrakant also said, that the biodiversity that is highlighted uh, for Western Ghats, when we say Western Ghats, some animals, some plants come to your mind immediately. So what we have found is, if you look at the invertebrates, so the, the lower forms of life, supposed lower forms of life, you will see that the diversity is at least 10 times, at least 10 times the number of animals, the vertebrates that you see. So, and the, 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 the bad part about this is that not many people know about it and not maybe many, many people are working on it. So this is just one group of animals that I have been working on. So when you look at the aquatic habitat, any aquatic ecosystem for that matter. So this is one example. This is just a small pond. What do you usually see? In this case, you don't see any animals, right? You don't see any animals, so say birds in such habitats. And normally a layman would just brush off saying that there is no diversity here. There are no animals here. And he or she would be totally mistaken 
because the diversity that you see with your naked eye is just the tip of the iceberg it's just the tip of the iceberg so there are so many hidden forms that you don't even know about so if you look at all these different animal forms these are found even in the smallest of the ditches that you see so they are uh, animals that are not from any exotic locales they are found right in ditches that are formed during the monsoons all these animals most of these animals so and uh, you must be knowing about uh, because the, this animal especially made news very recently tardigrades water bears that were accidentally i think uh, on on moon or mars i uh, on moon i think so th these guys made news very recently so uh, if you look at these forms these are just a few of the forms that i have put forth just to uh, highlight the fact that there are lots of animals that you don't know about i work on one particular group of such animals called as a branchiopods so if you look at a branchiopod typical branchiopod it basically means the legs having gills so gills are the respiratory organs organelles of these animals so these animals have the typical characteristic of having respiratory or, uh, organelle attached to its limb and that is why it's called a branchiopod uh, this is one again a very commonly found branchiopod in even in india in western ghats very commonly found and this these if you look at this motion the wavy motion these are its legs so while it's swimming it also respires at the same time and if you look at this particular section you will see that these are its offsprings and they are already developed they are entirely developed animals that are there in the something called as brood pouch and we'll look into details of this animal a little bit so few general characteristics some of these animals are something called as flagship species and what do i mean by flagship species is they are the most representative group if you look at any temporary water body that is not disturbed and the best example i can give you are the the pools that you see <clears throat> on hills very commonly more or less in monsoon you will see one or the other member of this particular group of animals and that is why they are the most representative groups they are always found in some or the other combination of animals related species so that is called as an assemblage assemblage of large branchiopods or branchiopods now what is their function so they function as the base level consumers in any food webs aquatic food webs they are mostly herbivores so they eat algae they eat bacteria but some of them are secondarily predators secondary predators and they also constitute major items of prey for fishes mostly and in some cases birds and insects also so they have a very important role in freshwater systems now they are commonly divided into two groups one is called as large branchiopods and the other is called as cladocera or water fleas now these are some of the habitats representative habitats that that you can find these animals so if you look on the image on the top left hand side you'll see it's a small pool that i talked to you about and if you look at the bottom image it's a large water reservoir so you see a range in habitats and you will see at least one or the other representative of these branchiopods commonly occurring in such habitats so how do i collect branchiopods branchiopods are easily collected by nets so even the the nets that you use for tea the net that you use for making tea you can collect branchiopods with such nets so you don't need any fancy equipment and depending on the place where you sample so if you look at a very large water body such as a lake that we just saw an image of there are different zones and you need not worry about the technical terms but there are different zones and based on these different zones you have different types of branchiopods see so 
for collecting animals in say the littoral zone littoral zone basically means vegetated zone there you will find different types of aquatic vegetation so you see certain species associated with such vegetation and you can sample them in by a particular type of net similarly in the limnetic zone or there's the open water zone you can collect the, these animals using different kinds of nets so these are this is something called as a tow net so basically your collection strategy depends on where you want to sample so there are as i said <clears throat> excuse me two major groups of brachiopods called large brachiopods and water fish so what are different types of large brachiopods the first group are is called as fairy shrimps and they are called fairy shrimps because they are very pretty to look at so they look like fairies that's what that's what how how they were named and i'll show you a video of, of one of the species the second group is called as tadpole shrimps and they are called tadpole shrimps simply because if you look at a live animal in its natural habitat it superficially resembles a tadpole and that's why it's called tadpole shrimp the third group is called as clam shrimp and they are called clam shrimps because if you look at this animal the carapace the external covering of this animal it looks like a bivalve looks like a clam and that's why they are called clam shrimps this is one more type of clam shrimp and this is the third type of clam shrimp so there are different types of clam shrimps that are found and the last is the water fiel so if you look at the morphology the shape of these animals you'll see a tremendous variation so if you look at fairy shrimps and if you look at a water fiel you will see that there is no actual morphological resemblance but they are still related so a characteristic fairy shrimp so as i said you need not worry about the technical terms they are just there for scientific purposes but fairy shrimps usually swim with their legs up and i'll show you a video so it becomes very evident they have a cylindrical body elongated body they have large pair of eyes so they are very big eyes and interestingly they have no carapace so there are they have no covering and you will see a gradual evolution of this carapace so how this carapace evolved you will see a gradual transformation in the groups these animals you will see in all types of temporary water bodies and few species also survive in inland saline water bodies so you have saline lakes you see some species that are exclusively find found found in such water bodies these animals usually feed on plankton mostly but some are secondarily predatory right they always have their sexes separate so you have a distinct male and female in this group and these animals produce something called as resistant resting eggs and i'll talk to you what these resting eggs are but this is a very characteristic trait or a characteristic uh, uh, adaptation seen in these crustaceans as well as some other freshwater invertebrates now if you look at this image this illustration you will see these weird structures so what are these these are males so there is a sexual dimorphism seen so you have a distinct male morphology you have distinct female morphology and you can see that the these structures are weird and differently shaped so that's how you identify a fairy shrimp so if you just collect females so females characteristically have this sack of eggs that you will always see in a female but with respect to males we'll always see a specific species has only a specific set of such antennae the morphology and as you uh, see different species you'll see that this morphology just changes variedly they have very varied morphology so these are some live images of of uh, some representatives of fairy shrimp so if you look at this antenna you will see that it's completely different from the antenna of this animal which is completely different from the antenna of this animal so it's a very highly morphologically distinct 
uh, species groups and very easily identifiable. So this is how a fairish one looks like. So if you look at them, they swim upside down. They have a cylindrical body and you will see, uh, if, you, if you would be able to see a female, but let's, a male never has a brood pouch. Okay, so you'll only see brood pouches in females. So yeah, so you, you see the structure that is its brood pouch. It might not be developed, but the, for female always will have a brood pouch. This is the male antenna, the round bulb structure. So it's tucked in and it extends during uh, reproduction. Now, these animals, as I said, don't have any carapace. So you, you can see all the limbs, they are naked, they are exposed. Yeah. These are very commonly seen in, in the rain fed pools that, are, that form on hilltops. You will see at least a, one species in each of the pools. There will be at least few species there. And as I said, you'll always find these animals associated with other types of large branchiopods. The second group, tadpole shrimp, now it interestingly has a morphological form which has remained unchanged for millions of years. So the evolution of this animal occurred during Jurassic, Jurassic period, which was at least 150 to 200 million years. And the morphological form more or less has remained stable. So you can imagine that they have not changed their morphology for millions of years. They superficially, as I said, resemble tadpoles and hence they are called tadpole shrimps. Now these animals are also exclusively found in temporary water bodies. You, you won't see them in lakes or rivers. You will always see them in small pools. Now, Interestingly, these animals, unlike fairy shrimps, have flattened bodies, right? We saw that the fairy shrimps have cylindrical body. These animals have flattened bodies and they swim with their legs down. So I'll show you a video. Now here, what happens is sexes are separate. You do see male and female in some species, but some species you see hermaphrodites. So you have this based on the species identity. Now these animals, are proven to be biocontrol agents of mosquitoes. So there has been research where people have shown that this can become an excellent biocontrol agent. But no one knows this besides the people who work on this one. So if you look at the picture on the bottom left hand corner, you'll see a fossilized triops, a fossilized nevrostracum. And if you look at the morphology of the extant species, which is the Indian species, you'll see that not much has changed in the morphology. And this is a live triops. You can see the, the limbs and the flattened body. And you can also see its carapace. It's very faint. These animals grow quite big. So if you look at the size of this, it's at least five centimeters and it still grows even bigger. We have seen even bigger triops. So they are very huge. The third group are the clam shrimps and they are called clam shrimps, as I said, because they possess a carapace. Now these animals have carapace that wraps around their body, entire body. And they look like clams, clam shell. And that's why they are called clam shrimps. These animals are also found exclusively in temporary water bodies. You don't see them in most of the representatives. You don't see them in permanent water bodies. So in lakes or rivers. Now here also, sexes, you see different distinct male and female in some groups. And you see hermaphrodites in some other groups. So that also depends on the species. These animals also produce resting eggs. And why I'm stressing resting eggs, the fact I'll discuss it a little later. Now, these animals are detritivores. So they feed on detritus by filtering. Now, this is a typical clam shrimp. And these are its resting eggs. So you can look at the ornamentation of this resting egg. It's just very beautiful. Some of the structures, some of the species are really beautiful. And interestingly, in these groups of clam shrimps, you identify the species 
not based on the animal morphology, but based on the egg morphology. So this is how important these eggs are in context of taxonomy also. This is one more type of clamshell. And uh, you can see the entire carapace. The animal is in, enclosed in the entire carapace with its head sticking up. The rest of the body is enclosed. Uh, the green structures that you see here are its eggs. So these are its eggs. These are quite small. So the largest clam shrimp won't be bigger than a few centimeters in India at least and easily visible through a, uh, with a naked eye. Now there is one type of clam shrimp called tropical clam shrimp, which is the only species that is found in permanent water bodies. So you'll find this animal in lakes, rivers, very commonly. So this is the only exception. And interestingly, these animals are parthenogenetic. So they don't usually have males in them. Most of them are always females. And they reproduce parthenogenetically to produce more clones of themselves. The last group uh, in, of branchiopods are the smallest of the lot. And these are called water fleas or cladocerates. Uh, I forgot to mention one fact that the total species number is a very conservative estimate. People still don't know how many species of branchiopods there are in the world. So they make conservative estimates simply because regions such as India or South Asia has not been explored at all. And from our research, we have seen that there are many, many new species waiting to be discovered. Many new species. Now, cladocerans, you will see them in all types of freshwater habitats. They are also seen in marine environments, but the species number is very less. So they are mostly restricted to either freshwater habitats or inland saline water bodies. But they have adapted themselves to live certain species in even the extreme environments, such as hot water springs or phytotelma, something called as phytotelma, which is basically water which accumulates in holes which are formed in trees. So you'll see some species that are specifically adapted to survive in such environments. So these anim animals also produce, reproduce parthenogenetically, most of the species. And males are very rare. So getting a male in your collection is very rare. Some of you might know this animal called Daphnia, which is one uh, major uh, group in branchiopod, which has been extensively studied. So if you look at literature, research literature pertaining to Daphnia, you'll see that there are thousands of papers because this animal is extensively used as a model system in ecotoxicological, even uh, evolutionary studies nowadays. So this is uh, one type of cladocerin that you see in polluted water bodies. So any polluted water body you go, you sample that particular water body, you are bound to find this, this species. And if you look at this red color, this red color is hemoglobin, which it produces. And it produces this hemoglobin to survive in conditions where the dissolved oxygen is very less. So this is one adaptation of this species, of, of this group for that matter. And if you look at this, this is a developing embryo. And this is its heart, which is pumping very fast. Now this is one more type of cladocerin. And you can see it doesn't look anywhere. It's not even close in, in morphology as the previous animal was. If you look at these structures, these are its limbs. This is its anus, and this is its abdomen, where you can see the food, which is uh, being digested. These are the eyes. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. You can see the heart also, which is pumping here. 
might not be that clear as, as the previous video. And these are very tiny, okay? These are about uh, 0.5 mm in length, these ones. But if you look at Daphnia, Daphnia is, is very big. It grows to at least 2 mm, 3 mm size. So you look at the different types of morphology that is seen within cladocerans. So all these are cladocerans species, different groups of cladocerans. If you look at the animal on the bottom right, you'll see it has a head which looks like a beak of a bird. Yeah, so they have wonderful distinct morphologies. But if you look at the size, you'll see that it's just 100 microns, which is 0.1 mm. So this is this animal is barely 0.2 mm in, in, in length. So resting eggs. All branchiopods lay something called as resting eggs. And why do they produce it? They are specifically produced due to different environmental factors. So as I said, most of the branchiopods that are that I showed you are found in temporary water bodies, right? So temporary water bodies only have water for a certain period of time. The rest of the time that habitat is dry. So to survive this dry conditions, they have this adaptation where the animal lays its eggs. They remain there for the dry period nothing happens to them and when the next inundation cycle the when the pool is filled with water these animals hatch or these eggs hatch out into new animals and because of this you have something called as egg banks of these animals that are formed in any habitat that you study and these egg banks are not restricted to branchiopods as i said resting eggs are also produced by a few other invertebrates and these egg banks form the latent diversity of that pool. So even if you see that a pool is dry, it already has a, a specific set of diversity there ready to be hatched when, when the conditions are correct. So look at the different types of eggs. So as I said, some of the legs, uh, eggs are actually very pretty to look at. So if you look at this particular egg, you can see the, the, the morphology of that egg. It's, it's really beautiful. And as I said, you can identify the species also. Now I'll talk to you about certain interesting adaptations that you see in these animals. This is one and the same species. This is one and the same species. But if you look at the morphology of this particular six forms, a layman will say these are six different species, right? So if you look at form number one and form number six, the morphology is totally different, but this is one and the same species. If you look at the head of animal one and animal five, it's completely different. So what is the case here? So what happens here is, they have this adaptation called as cyclomorphosis, which means their morphology changes cyclically. And why cyclically? What happens is these adaptations are triggered again by certain environmental conditions. And in this case, if the predator density increases, to avoid this predation, they develop these spines. So they have very big spines if you have a lot of fish in, in these such habitats. So this is a very common adaptation that is seen. And once, if you remove those fishes from that system, they again resort to the normal body form. So that is the very interesting and cool thing about the, these uh, water fields. Now, when I say parthenogenesis, this is not obligate parthenogenesis that you see in branchiopods. You have something called as cyclical parthenogenesis. So what happens in that is, you, when the conditions are good in an environment, you only see females which parthenogenetically give rise to clones. All right. Whenever the conditions deteriorate, environmental conditions, the female shifts from producing parthenogenetic animals to sexually reproducing animals. So a parthenogenetic female will give rise to a sexual female and a sexual male. So these, this is a male. 
it looks completely different and it's very rare as i said these the sexual female and the sexual male mate to produce these resting eggs yeah then these resting eggs will survive the harsh conditions in the dried this uh, sediment and whenever the the pool or the pond is filled again these will hatch out into parthenogenetic females so this cycle repeats itself continuously and this is a very interesting adaptation in certain crustaceans including anthropods now all of you must know a flamingo right so the interesting thing about the color in flamingos is that it gets its its color from the plankton that it feeds on and these plankton have a red pigment now these plankton are also eaten by some branchiopod crustaceans so these flamingos non specifically eat the diatoms as well as these branchiopod crustaceans and that's why they accumulate this red color this particular uh, some of you might have also heard about artemia or the brine shrimp so you can look at the red color this color is as a, it's because of eating these small uh, diatoms okay so this is again a very uh, interesting uh, thing about about large branchiopods now where do these plankton or branchiopods fit in right so this is a something called as typical as a, a food web aquatic food web and you see at the very base are the phytoplankton so they are the producers right they have chlorophyll in them so they produce more biomass which is then taken up by zooplankton they eat these phytoplankton at the same time it the zooplankton which means the the water fleas serve as a prey item for these fishes which then serve as food for the birds and it might look that these plankton look very insignificant in this food web i'll show you what happens if you remove these plankton we have actually done a study and i'll share some results with you also interestingly the waste products from these birds also increase the number of phytoplankton because they enhance the nutrients in these water bodies right and because of higher number of phytoplankton you see higher number of zooplankton in such habitats and zooplankton basically is a term which is used for small or typically microscopic animals that you see in freshwater bodies or even marine environments so cladocerans being microscopic are also referred to as zooplankton now i'll share some very interesting findings right from western ghats so again as i said no exotic localities right from western ghats and some of these uh, findings are just say i found new species just few kilometers away from the city one of the species that i found was right in pune university campus new species so this is the first uh, discovery that i made uh, it was a new species of fairy shrimp which was restricted to northern western ghats it's only found in few pools on few hills in the northern western ghats region and by northern western ghats i mean western ghats of maharashtra and goa so as i said if you just uh, invest some time in understanding this diversity which is unseen you don't usually see these animals very uh, as as commonly as you see a bird or a butterfly but there is a hidden diversity if you just pay a little more attention we'll see that it's full of different types of animals such habitats are full of animals this is the species that i'm talking about so if you look at this habitat it's a small ditch it was a ditch of length of 1 foot or 1.5 feet that's it and it, it had a depth of 5 to 6 cm and it's all muddy right and we found a new species there of this water fly so interestingly after studying it we saw that the closest relative of this species morphologically is found in the caribbean islands 
So if you look at the geographical distance between the two, it's it's huge, and you still find such interesting animals in in your own backyard. As I said, all you have to do is search for them. Now, when I said that some of these cladocerans have adapted themselves to live in some extreme or unusual environments, so this is one species that we found. <clears throat> excuse me. This is one species that we found living on the water films that accumulate on such bryophytes or moss that you call in colloquial terms. So it's a very thin film of water. right and these animals specifically live in this what type of habitat if you put this animal in a open water chamber it dies it cannot swim so if you look at this animal you will see rather than swimming it crawls that is a modification or a adaptation to survive in this environment so it has different types of morphological parts that are adapted to help it navigate such environments and again this animal is very small it's just about 250 to 300 microns uh, 0.3 mm in in length we also found water fleas in hot water springs so as i said it was if you look at the habitat you will see it's nothing to look at right it has even plastic dumped in it but we <clears throat> even though seeing such a habitat it was a hot water spring so we decided to sample it and we found cladocerans there the temperature of this particular site was 41 or 42 degrees and it had a salinity of 4 to 5 ppt parts per thousand so it's very high it's almost nearly assuring water and you see fresh water species surviving in it so that is a very it was a very interesting discovery now you also see very cool adaptations in uh, cladocerans so uh, to survive in as i said unusual habitat so one of the unusual habitat that people rarely sample is something called as the interstitial region so it is basically one type of subterranean environment where you find water okay and if you look at the species on the left the photo on the left you will see a cladocerin species which is found in your regular pools and ponds same genus so same representative but the species is different we sampled from such interstitial region and again this was a uh, about 70 80 kilometers from pune so it was not very far also and we found this particular species this is still not described by the way it's a new species and if you look at some of the adaptations the most characteristic is the loss of eyes because it lives in a environment where there is no light and that's why its eyes are degenerated completely degenerate you see white patches here so there is no eye so the again the point that i want to emphasize is there is lot of hidden diversity just there present there right now all you have to do is go there and look at it carefully we made a very interesting uh, finding on observation that this is a water flea okay the big one with the eyes it was sort of a substratum for this another type of plankton called as rotifers and if you see they are all attached to these animals so initially we thought that this might be some random occurrence that we are seeing but then we search for it online and we saw that these uh, occurrences are not that random but are very rare people say that this occurs due to predation pressure so to avoid predation all these rotifers just stick to one substratum that they can find what we found out was these associations were only found when the pollution levels were very high so when the dissolved oxygen was very less these associations were very common so why how we unfortunately were not able to continue this study but this is one interesting observation that we saw
when I talk to you about the role of these small animals in uh, food webs, we actually did a study. So there is this lake in Pune called Pashan Lake. Earlier, uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, this lake was beautiful. It used to have a lot of aquatic diversity. So we used to find hundreds of invertebrate species commonly, very commonly there. Then what happened was, in the name of beautification, this lake was desilted. And by desilted, what happens is the complete sediment of this lake was removed. And if you remember, all the resting eggs of these animals are always found in the sediments. And all those resting eggs, the egg banks were gone. They were gone. With that, what they did was they removed the submerged plants that are naturally occurring there. So they removed their habitats. Additionally, if you look at the buildings here, the waste is directly discharged in this particular lake. So you have pollution. And at the same time, they introduced some invasive species of fish in the waters. So a result of this was a complete collapse of the food web in Pashan Lake. And this is the picture that we took in 2015, where it's completely covered by Pistia and Icornia, which is a telltale sign that the water is eutrophic. So it's, it, has, it has very high concentrations of nutrients. So what we did was we sampled, we had already samples before this beautification had occurred. <clears throat> and we found out that just cladocerans, okay, this is just cladocerans. We had 30 species that we found in one year. In a single year, we were able to get 30 species. That reduced to five species in 2015 after the beautification. So you can see the number of species drastically reduced. I am not saying that this is a cause effect relationship, but it has to do at least some part in collapse of this food. And that is why these animals are extremely important in normal functioning of such aquatic habitats. Very important. So what are the major threats? The main threat that you see is pollution. And it, it deals with organic pollution as well as inorganic pollution. So any pollution, you won't see most of these branchiopods. Large branchiopod species are not able to survive in polluted bodies. So they are a good indicator of clean uh, environmental conditions. So if you see a branchiopod, large branchiopod in a pond, it usually means that the water there is good. The second important uh, threat, major threat is <clears throat> habitat destruction. So if you look at these small ponds when they are dry, basically nobody will even understand or know that there is hidden diversity there. So such habitats are destroyed completely for, for various development projects. And we have seen with our own eyes, very good habitats being destroyed completely. And a very overlooked threat, which is very pertinent is introduction of invasive or exotic species. You must have heard of this fish called guppy fish and mosquito fish. These fishes were introduced as a measure for mosquito control. And they did anything but control mosquitoes. These animals, these fishes are non-specific when they feed. So if you put this animal in a habitat, such as where you find large branchiopods, these large branchiopods are not adapted to evade such predators and they become prey. And if you see a guppy in a habitat, you won't find many zooplankton species, large branchiopod species. You won't find them. You'll only find guppies. So you'll only find mosquito fish. But this is something that is unfortunately not told. So now you know and you have to understand the significance of introducing such exotic species in our own habitats, okay? So this is uh, what I'll end with. So next time you see any water body, 
just take a few seconds to appreciate the unseen diversity just few seconds so even if you see a ditch just think that there is going to be hidden diversity lot of diversity that you won't see very easily all right so uh, now luckily with this uh, company biologia i work with we are undertaking such works where we identify species where where we do environmental impact assessments so or pashan lake work was one such example that we did we are actually still doing it and we are getting very interesting findings so if you are interested you can look uh, our facebook page or linkedin page and and uh, contact us if you are interested so with this uh, i'll stop my lecture and i'll be happy to take any questions thanks for me that was really interesting and uh, i think we've all learned a lot about you know these uh, very specific little uh, creatures so uh, we have someone who's uh, uh, who's asked a question about uh, the littoral zone or the intertidal zone are they mostly uh, the same or are they separate littoral zone is any zone that has submerged vegetation but intertidal zone is completely different it's it's where fresh water meets the salt water so it can be a open water region also so littoral region means a region where you find uh, aquatic vegetation okay excellent i think that answers that well um someone is asking about the effect of climate change and microplastic on uh, zooplankton or these uh, tiny crustaceans okay so interestingly my postdoc work was based on how climate change here when i say climate change it was temperature increase so you see global warming that is happening so what i was studying was how this temperature increase affects the evolutionary responses in these water fleas and what i did basically was what i was checking was if increasing the temperature the ambient temperature what responses do you see in daphnia using uh, daphnia as a model system of course what i saw was till a certain point these animals do cope up with temperature increase and how do they do that is that they reduce their reproductive rate so if they are producing 15 offsprings they'll produce five they'll have smaller body size to cope up with this temperature change but beyond a certain point they just die so there is a limit beyond which these animals won't survive with respect to microplastics i have not come across any literature this is a very interesting question that i'll also look into okay thank you so it's good to hear that they are able to survive up to a certain degree uh so are considering that you mentioned resting eggs and those banks and things like that um are adults able to survive during the drought period though not really so their life span is not that much so it is it is such that they survive the wet phase of that particular season and they die so oh. two months three months and then they are dead right uh someone is asking about when you collect the sample um how do you uh, differentiate and is there any method you use to differentiate so for large branchiopods you i showed you the differences in morphology so it's very uh, obvious that you can separate out these animals but for water fleas you need stereo microscopes to to identify and there are different keys so we taxonomists use different identification keys to identify certain morphological traits for certain species so i showed you the example of the eggs and these eggs are very informative so sometimes you need microscopes for for identifying these animals right so uh, i think the question is about how are you separating them from the water do you oh for that it's uh, you use the filter the mesh the net okay. that we use and then we collect the whole sample as is then we bring that sample to the lab and then we start sorting out because these the, the especially the water fleas since are they are very small separating them out on the field is impossible so you get whole sample and then you start separating out in the lab okay great so uh, 
someone wants to know can you uh, monitor seasonal observations in pools along flood plains of fresh water yeah we we have actually done that uh, with respect to rocky outcrops if you have heard of of that term rocky outcrops so they are basically high altitude uh, hills with flat tops where you find lot of pools during monsoons but as far as flatlands go we have not uh, done any seasonal study but there are lot of studies done in europe with in this regard which you can easily find through google scholar okay great thanks and uh, so we have someone who wants to ask their question live nishita yeah. please go ahead um hi nishita you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question hello hi uh, hi i just wanted to know uh, is there any particular origin of this brachiopods i mean particular place uh you mean evolution of yeah of yeah the... yeah evolution where where does it i mean like for example we have a uh, few origins like in plants mango is origin originated from northern northeastern part of india so i just want to know this uh, particular uh, brachiopods where are they originated from so there is no one place people that uh, at least people have at least found out till date that this was the place where they evolved from so people are still working on find the problem with th these animals is the fossils are very hard to find okay. that's why explaining the paleontological or the evolutionary significance the origin part becomes a little tricky Uh, Samir, I think this might be a good time to talk about you know how the how you uh, uh, the biogeography and how you study biogeography with regards uh, to fresh water. Okay, uh, so uh, with respect to species distributions, uh, what we do is we check the ranges of species, the known ranges of species, and we then try to ascertain which species are supposedly widely distributed. so you have these species occurring not in india but also in pakistan or sri lanka or nepal but few of these species are restricted to only few localities say in the western ghats so what we determine is since they are found uh, uh, since they have varied in their distribution what would be the different factors so unfortunately due to funding crunch we have not been able to do the genetics part the molecular uh, sequencing and taxonomy part of it but from the literature survey what we found out was with respect to india it is completely based on the climate so you see the peninsular indian region you will see a certain type of species that are found there and in the temperate region so if you go towards himalayas you will see a completely different fauna there and it's restricted only to these northern regions so you can actually just by searching literature you can actually analyze a lot of data that is already been there in circulation and then analyze the pattern so this is basically the biogeographical work that we are trying to do with respect to brachiopods great i um i guess uh, nishita has something to add go ahead nishita Uh, sir, uh, what, uh, are what uh, are there any uh, biogeography studies done on these brachiopods i mean particular uh, of the water free what you were mentioning about oh uh, yeah so uh, there are now few study but the unfortunately the sad part of it is you have biogeography studies where they don't consider south asia because simply because they don't have samples so okay. the south asian origin of animals is still mostly unknown but we have a few papers where we have shown where the indian tadpole shrimps mm -hmm. the indian tropical shrimps might have come from so it's mostly african origin which okay. then came into india okay thank you sir great okay thanks nishita for your questions uh we'll go back to the q and a since we've got a lot more new questions yeah. and then we'll uh, switch to another person who's raised their hand um So, is it easy to extract DNA and carry out molecular work with these tiny organisms? Uh, with respect to, <clears throat> excuse me, large brachiopods, it's relatively easy. But with respect to water fleas, we at least in India have not been able to do it properly yet, and it takes a lot of funding also, and we are always short on on the funds. So, we are trying our best. But yeah, people have done it uh, abroad. So. 
if you search for daphnia you will find a lot of literature on its uh, evolution and biogeography using molecular studies great and uh, so you mentioned that they are uh, seasonal right the, their yeah. lifespan so they last maybe 2 to 3 months is that what you mentioned yeah 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 okay great and uh, we'll allow harshit to ask a question now harshit please go ahead hello am i audible yes um first of all good morning to everyone i have a quick question on if uh, like in invertebrates you usually see them in some or the other usually many of them have a ecolo ecological interaction like symbiosis parasitism right. commensalism right. do we have something like this in crustaceans or brachiopods yeah yeah it's very cool. so i showed you with epizoic rotifer on the on the cladoceran right so you have interactions occurring very commonly uh, in other crustaceans also so it's not just restricted to brachiopods you see them in prawns also in crabs also so you have tiny crustacean parasites ectoparasites that are commonly seen on crustaceans themselves so it's very common and it has as far as crustaceans go it's not even seasonal if you have both the species more or less you'll see an ectoparasitism commonly occurring and the egg survival which you said i mean after the monsoon i mean between the two monsoons yeah. is there any interaction there the survival mechanism of the egg or is it fully the egg or you know with yeah, some so other the, basically it's all dry so there is no interaction as such so they lie there passively until the next monsoon comes the water comes okay thank you yes. okay great uh, thanks harshit coming back to our uh, uh, questions um someone is asking about whether uh, they are able to survive high pressure uh, or so, so that they can be present in benthic conditions or is there anything known about whether they survive there uh large brachiopods because they are found in temporary water bodies the the depth of these water bodies generally does not exceed a few meters so the pressure as such is not that that much uh as far as cladoceras go few species are found in benthic conditions but again benthic conditions in fresh water is still not that deep if you are comparing it to marine conditions where you actually see animals kilometers down that is not the case with with cladoceras uh brachiopods okay great uh, so you've mentioned some of the challenges of working with these uh, organisms but uh, are there any other ones you would like to mention other uh, groups of animals no 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 uh, so what are the main practical challenges of working with these oh yeah so the first and most important challenge that we faced was a uh, lack of literature so not many people have worked on it in india or even as far as large brachiopods go it's a global problem so there is not much literature to go with secondly there are no i won't say no experts but there are very few experts so to identify the animal itself is a challenge so forget about doing any ecology or biodiversity work unless you identify the animal correctly you can't move forward so that was our main challenge to to overcome and that is still i won't say we have over uh that that problem we are still dealing with it but we are dealing with it now in a much better way that we used to than the 5 years back great uh so again this is coming to questions about uh using brachiopods as model organisms yeah. uh so someone wants to know can they be used for metal toxic uh toxic yeah, yeah. in aquatic so, yeah or, so yeah. the thing is with daphnia uh it's a ecotoxicity model system so you can basically use daphnia in to test any type of of uh, inorganic or organic pollution or, or or toxicity tests so and there are defined tests by EPA of the united states where they have given exact protocols how to culture them how to because culturing them in specific conditions is mandatory if you are doing some standard tests so you will get ample literature online for for growing and testing with daphnia but Great. with other species uh, not much that that's good to know uh, so someone is asking about uh, the uh, whether the the you know the flamingos that pigment you mentioned which is from the brachiopods 
so what is it called i think is the question what was the red pigment uh it's a uh, carotenoids i don't know the exact uh, pigment that is from it is of a carotenoid type okay great um and someone wants to know can uh, what is our interaction with branchiopods do they cause human diseases are they affecting us in any way and thing like that or are they positively affecting us other than mosquito biocontrol for instance uh there is no negative uh, effect of branchiopods as far as i know uh, there are few papers but i don't know uh, with with respect to branchiopods there are no negative uh, aspects of it as far as direct benefits go this is the the most crucial part of it so their presence ensures proper ecosystem functioning in in freshwater habitats but besides that direct uh, nowadays i have seen a few papers of using this animal as alternative food for humans also so the large branchiopods they are growing lots of fairy shrimps in actual aquaculture ponds trying to grow them as alternative food so this is one direct i would say use but it's not exploited that much then okay okay and uh, so uh, that earlier question about flood plains uh, so the person was asking actually about you know when the uh, the river flood plains not so uh, generally what you spoke about uh she wanted to know what happens on the flood plains of rivers when with branchiopods uh so uh, you find a lot of cladoceran species there so there have been lot of uh, faunistic checklists that have been published from northeast india so brahmaputra you'll find uh, a few papers on the flood plains of brahmaputra on on the zooplankton diversity so there is a professor i don't know if he works there uh, still is active i, I mean professor b k sharma so if you are interested you can just search for his name and he has done quite some interesting work there on finding the the seasonality of of these uh, plankton with respect to flooding of the river but you do find lot of water fleas as far as large branchiopods go uh, at least i don't have any reports of large branchiopods from uh, river flood plains but uh, cyclisteria the, the tropical clam shrimp you might find them in in such uh, habitats okay great that's um, interesting uh, so uh, someone wants to know about the uh, how resting eggs are protected from predation during these unfavorable conditions you know how are they surviving kind of okay so the first thing is you don't have any aquatic predators simply because the habitat is dry secondly these eggs if you look at them they look like sediment their color is brown so they mix with the sediment they have a camouflage so so you won't be able to easily identify them unless you look uh, if you clean the sediment and then look under a microscope so if you just look at a patch of mud or dirt from the dried pool you won't be able to figure out which is an egg or which is which is the sediment part so they have this uh, protection working with them okay uh yeah i guess uh that answers that question um uh what about uh, how are different species of crustaceans coexisting within the same habitat so do they have competition for the resources and things like that uh, yeah so there is interspecific competition occurring but uh, the the trunk limbs uh, the limbs that i showed you which were functioning in the in the video so these limbs have minute modifications so that each species which coexists has a separate micro niche which it can exploit and hence you see certain species co-occurring very easily and if you have similar uh, limb modifications species occurring in the same habitat there is bound to be competition there so that does occur okay. as far as large branchiopods go all the three types of large branchiopods exploit different niches so there is no competition as such there okay that that's good to hear uh so i think a few questions are kind of about being a researcher right now 
so uh, you know how do you come across an organism and ascertain whether it's a new species or not okay so once we collect the samples and start observing in the lab what we do is as i said we have to have first the literature ready so whatever has been published earlier with regards to say cladoserms i will already have the literature with me and then i'll start searching for similar looking animals that i'm seeing now what happens is while you are studying the animal based on your experience you come to understand that that animal has certain morphological traits that you have not seen previously okay now it might happen that this species is either new or this species is a species which has not been properly uh, published the details about that species so then what you do is the next step is you have to consult with the experts what they what their take is on on this particular say supposed new species if they also say that yeah this species looks to be something different then you start uh, actually noting down the different uh, va- variations or different morphological traits that you think are unique right and then you have to take the call as an expert to declare whether that species is new or not so this is a little bit subjective when it comes to saying that this species is new but if you have ample literature then this question doesn't arise simply because you have comparative uh, information available so if you work with a group such as butterflies you will have hundreds and thousands of papers describing the different species of butterflies properly given this information you won't make any mistakes identifying a new species right but with respect to groups like say water flies this becomes a little bit subjective and that's why you have some species which have been wrongly described and then later synonymized and confu- making just uh, the, the taxonomy field a little confusing okay uh, i think that explains this fairly well uh, so uh someone wants to know about um the uh, okay so i'll read the exact question so do branchiopods vary in species morphology or life history across the western ghats as the wet season duration increases uh, from the north to the south so this is a really good question but the thing is we don't have samples from the southern western ghats and we are really interested in working on on those animals also because we think you will definitely find something new there with with new different adaptations so the answer is i don't know so as far as maharashtra and goa goes you fairly find a, a standard monsoon pattern there so we have pools which are with water from june to to october november so yeah so we'll we don't we don't know is the answer okay uh so i guess there are uh, what we're finding in a lot of these talks is that you know there's still so much to be explored and um so someone wants to know about any uh, morphological taxonomic key so is there you know a, a combined resource that they can refer to or something okay so for water fleas there is a book by zsi zoological survey of india these it's by bk sharma that i mentioned and mike george michael so these are the two authors they published a key for indian cladoserms it's a old key but it's a very good book to start with so you'll be able to figure out majority of at least the genera that are found in india so for species you can go for individual papers for large branchiopods unfortunately there is no key as of yet i have a few papers but uh, they are dealing with specific species rather than the fauna itself so i plan to do that in in coming future to write a, a key for indian large branchiopods that's really great to hear uh, and uh, same so we'll take one more question yeah. since i know it's quite late for you uh, no it is fine <laughs> Krishna Khan please go ahead and ask your question live Uh Krishna Khan Um 
ओके मेबी वील जस्ट गो बैक कैन आई ऑडिबल मैडम यस यस गो अहेड हां हां सर गुड मॉर्निंग या सर आई एम कृष्णकांत बक्सी फ्रॉम रिसर्च स्कॉलर ऑफ महाराजा कृष्ण कुमार सिंह जी भावनगर यूनिवर्सिटी सर हेलो आई एम नॉट एनी क्वेश्चन बट आई एम जस्ट शेयरिंग वन माय रिसर्च थिंग विथ यू दैट सर व्हेन यू वर्किंग इन द हाई टर्बिट एरिया हाई टर्बिट वाटर इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू माइक्रोस्कोपिक वर्क बिकॉज एन द टाइम ऑफ द माइक्रोस्कोपिक एनालिसिस हाई टर्बिडिटी इज कॉज सो मेनी डिफिकल्टी सर राइट Yeah, yeah, it it does. It it becomes very tricky to to sample from such habitats. Yeah, we also face that problem. Thanks for the comment, Krishna Gant. Um, good luck with your research as well. Um, let's just do one last question. Um, someone wants to know about uh whether so I will do a general question for this. Are are the brachiopods in sort of an immediate danger or threat? Is there a need for, you know, uh, desilting their water bodies or something like that? So, uh, as far as large brachiopods go, some of the new species that we have found. So the the species that we found in Pune University, it's the only locality that one pool is the only locality of that species till date. So just imagine if someone destroys that ditch. that species is extinct similarly for the ferrisium that we described it's only found on three rocky outcrops in the entire western ghats at least till date of maharashtra and goa and some of these uh, outcrops are now destroyed for tourist attractions so they are building hotels there so they just rampantly without even considering anything destroy those habitats so even if you put pollutants in such habitats just plastic waste or or dump their sewage there these animals are not going to survive so many of the endemic species that we have found are in trouble so just because of uh, anthropogenic pressure but as far as the water fleas goes many of the species are quite widely distributed so immediate threat there is none okay that's that's good to know um thank you so much samir and thank you to all our attendees for their very interesting questions um and um, i think we'll wrap up the session here and uh, so damni would you like to add anything yes uh yeah uh, it was a very interesting session uh, we thought about brachiopods thanks samir and uh, we will never be taking uh, water bodies uh, so lightly anymore we will thank you thank you madam thank you species thank you and thanks everyone for your very active participation and uh, we will be seeing next week uh, next sunday and i would like to thank the communications team for uh, being uh, so supportive and enthusiastic as ever thank you see you next week thank you see thank you, you for the opportunity bye bye oh uh, one second we have one quick poll um some here yeah. for you yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, very quickly just to know about our audience uh, everyone you will see a little box please fill it in right now and then we'll be done uh, samir if they want to contact you with more questions uh, where can they contact you uh you can just forward them my email address so i can put that in the chat here yeah yeah sure sure no problem great thank you so much samir and we are just getting the responses to our poll yeah. if everyone can fill that in that would be great hey the s is smaller ha uh -huh. lowercase okay thank you so much and uh, we'll we'll end here okay thank you pavitra thank you chunu thank you so in case uh, all of you want to share this talk it's also available there on youtube as well so uh, please uh, uh, share the talk on youtube uh, in the future and uh, thank you so much for all the very interesting for the very interesting uh, participation and i'll be closing the call bye bye